dull pleasure to welcome Dr. Herbert Puchter, who will be taking us behind the scenes of the creation of some much loved course books. Um, Herbert hardly needs any introduction from many of you, I'm sure, um, but he's a writer of course books and resource books. He's been a plenary speaker at numerous international conferences and has conducted workshops and given seminars in more than 50 countries. For almost three decades, he's carried out research into the practical application of findings from cognitive psychology um, and brain research to the teaching of English as a foreign language. And Herbert's latest course books are the forthcoming Supermind second edition for primary, the upcoming Think second edition for secondary, and um, Empower for adults. But that's quite enough from me. So Herbert, it's over to you in Austria to take us behind the scenes and let us in on some of your secrets. Thank you. Thanks very much, Oliver, for this kind introduction and for chairing uh, the session. It's a pleasure. I'm delighted to have been invited to present at the Cambridge Global Schools Festival. And I'd especially like to thank you, our colleagues, from all over the world. I've just looked at the chat box and seen the messages from so many different countries from, uh, you know, uh, all over the world, basically, uh, for taking part in this session. When I received the invitation um, for this talk, the, I'm just um, going to share my screen here with the um, slides, okay. When I received, here we go, the invitation for this um, uh, session, um, uh, the key challenge I saw uh, straight away was how to make it relevant for you. After all, as practicing, practicing teachers, which I assume most of you are, um, I was, I was uh, wondering, I mean, you want course books that I think you can trust that work and course books that help you motivate and challenge your students. At the same time, you might feel that the actual process of creating course books is of interest only to those who envisage writing one to one day. I believe I found an angle that will hopefully give you some insights into how my co-authors and I um, create our course books and perhaps also help you see your own teaching from a new and interesting perspective. If you're not 100% sure where I'm going here, I understand. So please bear with me for a while. It'll soon become perfectly clear, I believe. At the beginning of the journey, I'd like to take you on for the next uh, 30 minutes or so was a young, teacher. Oops. This uh, was me in my early years, uh, early years of teaching, that is, uh, teaching young teens. It's said that teachers tend to teach the way they were taught and not the way they were taught to teach. Meaning that when we start um, uh, teaching, the most powerful influence on us is the way we were taught as learners at school ourselves, rather than how we learned to teach at university or teacher training college. Well, I'd learned English in the Austrian equivalent of um, a grammar school. So the concept of language teaching that I subconsciously picked up as a learner was that teaching is an act of transmission. Let me just see if I can get the next slide. Yes. Teaching um, an act of transmission, like what happens when the tank of a car gets filled up. As Andrew Johnson uh, points out in his book, Essential Learning Theories, a book I enjoyed reading when preparing for this uh, session, uh, teaching from this perspective um, is the act of transmitting knowledge from point A, teacher's head, or the course book in, in uh, uh, our context here, to point B, um, student's heads. 
In this process, the teacher simply puts knowledge, such as lexis or grammatical forms, into the students' brains and regularly assesses whether the students have learned enough uh, for the teaching objectives to be reached. Along with the development of the communicative approach that I wholeheartedly embraced as soon as it began to emerge, um, a new conceptual paradigm arose without me in those days being aware of this being a new paradigm, uh, teaching as transaction. In that approach, teachers do not just fill up the students' empty brains with knowledge, uh, but facilitate their active and more autonomous participation in the learning process. I began to see my own role more and more as a facilitator in my uh, students' process of actively gaining knowledge and developing skills. I think that the idea of uh, bees busy in their hive um, is actually a splendid metaphor for this kind of learning, not only because of bees proverbial um, diligence and high level of activity, but also because according to recent research, these very sociable insects can learn new skills from one another and they demonstrate a remarkable ability to improvise and to solve um, problems. But then with age and experience, I began to uh, rediscover in my case, the vision that had initially motiv motivated me, sorry, to become a teacher. And I'm pretty confident that you or uh, quite a few of you will have had similar reasons for choosing this career. I didn't only want to be a good teacher, helping my learners uh, learn English well. Um, I had a deep down passion to go beyond being a language teacher and become an educator um, who would make a real difference to my students' lives as well. So finally, what I saw very clearly um, in front of me um, is uh, what we could call uh, teaching as transformation. In this process, the teacher is not only concerned with the learner's language learning and skills development, but goes beyond those and sees the students as human beings on their way towards becoming caring, responsible, and clear thinking um, adults. And we are, of course, talking here about uh, students being either children at uh, primary or teenagers, okay? Um, uh, so teaching of, the, of transformation. Let's consolidate what we have heard so far, okay? Um, we've looked at three concepts of teaching. Transmission, you remember the um, car or the tank of the car being filled up. Transaction and transformation. And each of these concepts, and that's my next point, each of these concepts of teaching is based on one or several uh, theories of learning. Transmission is about uh, behaviorism. In this process, learning is a change in behavior as the result or the outcome of instruction. Um, classroom action in this concept of learning will be teacher focused, but not necessarily something with the kind of negative connotations that this term teacher centeredness or teacher focusedness is um, uh, sometimes um, associated with these days. Teacher centeredness can also mean that the focus is on a master teacher who is concerned with motivating each and every student, finding what's best for them and helping them learn most effectively. Um, transaction is about a range of cognitive learning theories from Pierre Shea via Lev Vygotsky and Kieran Egan 
towards constructivism and neurological learning uh, theory. Learning, according to these theories, is about a change in cognition and the creation of neurological uh, networks. And finally, transformation. This is, as I've said, about um, the teacher's awareness of working with human beings. Um, and the theories this is based on, the learning theories this is based on, actually there are three, and they are uh, humanistic, um, transpersonal, and holistic uh, learning. And learning is, a tra is transformation as an outcome of the learner's experience and um, reflection. These are, of course, all big chunks words, chunk words, worthy, I hope, of the big stage, the big ideas stage we are on, and indicative, I believe, of the enormously important role that you as a teacher have in the development of the young and teenage learners you're working with. And connected um, to these big ideas, um, there are two very concrete takeaways for you. I believe, and that's actually takeaway number one, that the choice is not whether I want to be a teacher who practices teaching as transmission, transaction, or transformation. It's not, I believe, a question of which of the three. Instead, it is, I think, a question of when I want to use a particular approach with my students and why. As responsible language teachers and educators of children and teenagers, we cannot afford to ignore any of these teaching concepts and learning theories. They are all important, I believe. Transmission um, or behavioral learning is about helping our students very, very important um, um, areas of language, lexis, chunks of language, structures, uh, pronunciation, intonation, and what have you. Trans action or cognitive learning is about helping students develop their thinking capabilities, um, buzzwords such as critical thinking or higher order thinking are all around these days, help them uh, develop their creativity, help them develop their, their problem, problem solving skills, their, their study uh, strategies, and so on and so forth. And this all happens um, through interaction and the students very active participation in the learning process. And transformational learning is about developing our students understanding that we're basically not alone in this world. It's about paving the way for the understanding that the way we live our life matters because each of us is part of a greater community with responsibilities not only for ourselves but indeed for the whole planet and its people. I think um, this is um, um, an area of learning that is becoming more and more important in uh, today's world. So that's the first takeaway that we can't ignore, I believe, any of these uh, learning theories. The second uh, takeaway, I believe, is that course books are only great if you're talking about creating great course books. Um, if you can rely on them to draw on all the concepts of teaching and theories of learning that we have discussed. And I, I've been thinking of a metaphor for this, and, and here is my metaphor for this. Um, if I have one belief about the role that 
my co-authors and I have in creating course books, it's that we are in service to you as teachers and in service to what you wish to do in the classroom. It's in many ways like when you're having a stressful day and, and you've just entered the staff room and a caring colleague makes you a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. Metaphorically speaking, the course books we create and all good course books, I believe, have a similar function. They need to support you in your important educational mission and not the other way around. Let me just drink a bit of water here. Unfortunately, not coffee. In order to, to exemplify um, what I've been talking about here, I'd now like to share with you a few examples um, from the forthcoming editions, actually, that Oliver also mentioned, of our most successful course books, Superminds and um, Think. And uh, I'd like to show you how these theories are put into action and the support you and your learners uh, can get um, from that. As far as um, Superminds is concerned, uh, I'd like to focus on the creation of, of stories. When we started on the second edition of Superminds and we carried out our research, the colleagues uh, that took part in our focus groups or um, who filled out our questionnaires almost unanimously said something along the lines of whatever you do, don't change the stories. My students love them. Wonderful feedback, obviously. So let's take this opportunity to look um, behind the scenes of the creation of the characters and the story plots. Stories have, as the educational philosopher um, Kieran Egan points out, two great powers. The first is that they are perfect tools to communicate information in a memorable um, form. We use stories as vehicles to get important language across to our learners. And we know that the more engaging um, stories are, engaging both emotionally and cognitively, the better um, for um, their memory, the better students will remember the language in the stories. This also means, of course, this is just an aside, that we have to select um, the, the language in the stories very, very um, carefully. Um, the second uh, power that stories have is the power to engage the learner's emotions. That's how they draw listeners in. And in our case, make the, the learners, the young learners here in, in this case, feel excited about the stories. So the language in them gets remembered longer and better, uh, which of course would be um, a, tra a transmissional aspect of, of uh, learning. Um, the characters and plots of the stories, and there is a lot of, of research evidence for that, need to grow and develop with the learners' ages. Um, and then there are other ingredients that are important. Stories for six to eight year olds, for example, need a clear structure with a beginning, a middle, where um, some kind of problem or conflict arises and an end when the problem gets resolved. And for this age group, we need a bit of magic, things that can't be explained logically, um, which as many of you know, in the case of superminds, um, are the superpowers uh, that the characters, at least in levels one and two, which are the two levels for six to eight year olds, have. It is the characters' um, superpowers um, 
that help them solve problems, of course. With the help of these qualities, the learner's imagination is sparked. So, so they find it easy to identify with the characters. And here's one more aspect. The tasks around um, these, around the stories, engage learners um, uh, cognitively and so add transactional learning qualities, while, of course, transformational aspects come into play as well. Why? Because the protagonists um, solve problems by pooling their strength, their, their, their superpowers, by helping people in need, by accepting that they um, themselves with their superpowers need to act responsibly and by realizing that everyone is important whether or not they have a superpower. There is a lot of evidence from research into the power of stories that when students get engaged in listening to or watching um, good stories, stories that have these ingredients um, actually contribute to their learning about the world, contribute to their understanding of the world. So this has been um, six to eight, the, the six to eight year old age range. Now let's have a look at uh, slightly older learners, eight to 10. Um, you know, those of you working with, with Superminds maybe, that um, the, the series of stories there is called The Explorers. And the protagonists are two children, Lucy and Ben. They have an old book that will lead them to treasure if they manage to crack a code. So you can see already here, we're not talking magic anymore so much. Here we are more talking about problem solving skills, using thinking strategies, applying thinking strategies, and, and so on. In line with the, with the story preferences of, of eight to 10 year olds, we developed this story as a fantasy. Fantasies are often um, about good fighting evil. So we came up with two antagonists um, as well. Um, so we have the two children and the two antagonists, Zelda and Horrocks. They are after the old book as they want to steal the treasure. And in this series of stories in line with the age and cognitive development of the learners, uh, as I've said, the story is not about magical powers anymore. It's um, more about uh, Lucy and Ben being guided by a strong motivation to solve problems and to do good. So they are passionate about reaching their goals, honest, helpful, caring, and fair. And this is how they become role models for the children and help them in problem solving and implying and applying their critical and creative uh, thinking. Let's have a brief look at an excerpt from one episode. This is from, from Students Book 3. Um, uh, so you can see the quality also of the new animation. I hope your broadband connection is good enough um, so you can actually see and hear how well these new animations um, have turned out. Here we go. Look for the first line of the rhyme. I really hope we can find it here. <gasps> Help! That was close. Where did it come from? I don't know, but someone is trying to hurt us. I can't see anyone. Look! 
there's a knight with a sword. He's coming after us. Let's run. Look, this is a good place to hide. I hope the knight doesn't find us. Shh, we mustn't make a noise. I've got an idea. Hold the lead. Buster, come here. That's it, Buster. Good dog. Okay, and I'll stop it here. You can imagine, I think, what the outcome is going to be. Okay, so this is how a story uh, or a series of stories, rather, um, for for ten to um, eight to ten year olds gets um, uh, put together, keeping the three concepts um, of learning in mind that I discussed previously. And now let's quickly have um, a look at uh, a couple of examples from uh, Think, um, looking at learning as transmission first will focus on form practice. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the number of teens who are in love with grammar is statistically pretty low and uh, they can find form practice particularly boring. But as teachers, we know it's important. Short drills uh, with a repetitive structure can help learners remember lexicogrammatical chunks and they can be transferred into the learner's own speaking and writing too. So, so we're talking transmissional uh, learning here. So what we can, we, what we can do is actually um, use an acceptable type of activity that can help generate um, that transfer and that's um, uh, grammar wraps, okay? So here's an example which uses very simple animation uh, on top of rhythm and rhyme, as you will see, and I believe a rather bizarre and memorable story. Um, the, the grammar um, uh, focus here is on present and past passive, as you can see. Um, this rap is based on a true story that happened in Montreal a few years ago during a magician's performance. The magician was about to do the famous cut a woman in half trick when a member of the audience who apparently believed it was going to be for real stormed the stage and attacked the maestro physically. Well, here's a short excerpt from the story in rap form that we have um, created. Okay, here we go. Most of us like to see magic tricks. We love to be fooled by them. Be fooled, but every now and then, my friend, whoop, a trick can go wrong in the end. The end. Uh. Here's a story they say is true that happened in Montreal. Uh -huh. A magician's assistant named Sarah Fox was locked up in a wooden box. A box. Ooh. The audience watched in amazement wow. how the box was put on two chairs. Uh. Now the box and Sarah will be cut in two, said the magician. Watch what I do. Uh. Mm. Mm. Uh. Uh. Woo. A man in the audience was terribly shocked. Uh. He ran onto the stage and grabbed the sword. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Obviously fun for the kids, um, great fun, I, I believe. Powerful in terms of helping students remember grammar. Um, it's um, a genre of, of uh, music that's very popular uh, with teenagers. Um, so what we're doing here is based on both transmission and transaction principles. As the psychologist Gosmami um, put it, there is evidence that if learners are taught oops, I'm sorry, are taught um, new information using a variety of their senses, learning will be stronger. Being a teenager is of course about wanting fun, but let's not be fooled. Teens also want to be taken seriously and we need to engage them in talking about real world issues and human values, qualities such as freedom, creativity, fairness, love, tolerance, empathy, and friendship. And this is where the choice of texts is so important. 
we need to help our students uh, get in touch with those important values and qualities through the texts we offer them. This text here is about friendship, for example. It's an authentic story about the friendship between a dolphin and a boy who is seriously ill. A moving story that is the starting point for a discussion in class about friendship with students using their critical thinking skills to rank order what's important for them in a friendship before they talk about their different views. Apropos of choice of texts, course books these days are by no means just books as we know, and texts are not just words on paper, um, printed on paper. A modern text genre is the flog that you can see in all kinds of YouTube um, channels. And um, so we have decided to use flogs in the second edition of um, our course book here, Think, um, to help students explore and develop um, key life competencies. So here is one flog that I'm going to share with you now, not the whole of it, just, just um, a short extract. Um, and um, the flogger, uh, whom you can see here, is talking about the importance of apologizing, of saying sorry. Sorry seems to be the hardest word. So, my dad loves this song. Sorry seems to be the hardest word from a very long time ago. And I think it must be true about sorry being the hardest word, that is. Because my dad never says sorry for playing it. But is it really so difficult? I mean, we all make mistakes, even me. And nobody's perfect, not even me. For example, most days I annoy my little brother, annoy my big sister, annoy my mum, annoy my dad, annoy my mum and my dad, make a mess in the kitchen, make a mess in my bedroom, make a mess in the bathroom, make too much noise when I close my bedroom door, make too much noise when I leave the house, make too much noise when I get back home, watch TV too loudly, play music too loudly. Do you need any more? I think you get the idea. So, saying sorry helps make this all better. Sorry, Mum. Sorry, Dad. I'm sorry, Ben. I'm sorry, Kate. That one is really hard, but that's all it takes. Of course, you have to mean it. Okay, so um, after watching this, this uh, vlog, and as I've said, it was just an extract of it, um, um, students um, do some comprehension work first, and then we engage them in various forms of critical and creative thinking. You can see the, the tasks, the analysis of the tasks here. And in doing so, they explore social responsibilities and reflect on this all means to themselves and their world. Um, we started out um, by looking, I'm, I'm just to, before I share with you the three mistakes that course book authors need to avoid at all costs, let me briefly sum up what we've discussed. We started out by looking at the three concepts of teaching, transmission, um, there we go, transaction and transformation. We looked at the learning theories connected to them and how all three are important for our students and why I believe they have to be key guidelines in the development of course books too. Finally, I showed you some snippets from the second editions of two um, courses of ours to exemplify how course books can support you in your important educational mission by drawing on the three types of teaching concepts and the learning theories we've discussed. And now the three caveats. And again, and not surprisingly, I guess, these are caveats for teachers um, just as much as for course book writers. The first one is don't underestimate your students' cognitive capabilities, especially when their language level is still low. So often when activities are designed for second language learners, the attempt to make the activities linguistically comprehensible runs the risk of removing uh, any intellectual challenges in them. 
learners are frequently disenchanted by activities designed to suit their language level, but which are way below their cognitive potential and thus fail to provide a challenge. Um, caveat number two, when you, when you call something a story and we, when you use something in the class and you call it a story, it needs to be a story, including desires, difficulties, and a resolution, not just a compilation of important or useful language. I've been lucky enough, I must say, uh, to work with teams of co-authors where every single one of us is a real story writer and not just a writer of language activities. And I think this is the right moment as well to stress the importance, not only of the right team of authors, but also and especially uh, the help, the support we get from our editorial teams and the research teams at Cambridge University Press. I cannot thank them enough. Ca uh, caveat number three, if you write for teens, there's no point just focusing on a bunch of the topics they say they are interested in. Instead, I believe topics and texts need to tie in with the psychological and developmental needs of young people. And coursebook authors need to have the in-depth knowledge that helps them select the topics and texts that will become the basis, not just for the transmission of language, as we've said, but for transaction and transformation in the classroom and in our students' minds and hearts. And with that, the mic goes back to Oliver. Well, thank you so much, Herbert. That was um, fascinating, a fascinating insight and some very interesting <laughs> uh lessons uh and it's been it's been great as following following things on the chat box because uh yeah your fans are out in force and uh they've they've enjoyed themselves um a, a great deal so that's that's just wonderful and the questions are starting to flow in now as well it's unlikely we're going to have um time to answer them all i'm afraid um but uh let's get cracking um there's a question here what stories are appropriate for older children because obviously you talked about six to eight and eight to ten for so what stories are appropriate for children from 10 to 12 to prepare them for the leap into post-primary school and the language demands of new subjects Yes, when, when we're talking about, about older teens, there is, of course, a growing interest uh, on the one hand in, in real life um, uh, topics and texts. And I've shown one very briefly, the, the story about the friendship and this, this boy who suffers a serious illness, a very moving story. Um, uh, and, and then, of course, when you, when you think of stories to use for for uh, teenage students, um, they have an interest in all these um, qualities that um, they need to develop um, inside of them, qualities that will help them to become responsible adults. I've mentioned some of them, tolerance and, and courage and, and creativity. So stories that are somehow um, that embrace these qualities are always great to use with, uh, with uh, teenagers. So rather than stories about celebrities, stories about heroes and heroines, people like you and me, who somehow have these special um, qualities. Okay, great. And here's an interesting question. For, uh, I wonder, and, and you'll know the answer to this. I wonder how long does it take to put a course book together with all the research and stuff? <laughs> yeah. um, well, it's it's an easy question and it's a difficult one at the same time because uh, it's it's difficult to actually say what is the start of 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 creating a course book. Um, the, the it's not the time when you actually sit down with your co-authors and you you start writing. Um, it's a, a lot of research goes into, into the creation of the concept, a lot of reading and thinking and, and observing classes and talking to colleagues and, 
and and talking to to children or or um, uh, teenagers uh, looking at uh, children's books uh, talking to teens about um, issues that are of concern to them etc 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 that all forms you know part of the 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 process of creating a, a course book uh, the, the action and then of course it's it's a question of carefully developing um, a syllabus or or the syllabuses because when you think of our courses we don't have just um, uh, language um, uh, syllabuses we also have a thinking syllabus where we we actually dovetail the the um, uh, kind of cognitive skills we want to um, um, activate in our students with the topics and with the language and so on and so forth so this all uh, takes a long time and then of course um, comes um, uh, research in terms of content in terms of topics in terms of text and then the actual writing which which i sometimes think is actually uh, the shortest part i i've always used to say well it takes about a year to write a, a level of a course book but but that's a very rough um, um a figure um it takes much longer when you take all the other um, aspects into into consideration sure. So we can safely say that you never stop talk, thinking about it, do you? I mean, <laughs> um, okay, just looking, we've got very little time left. I hope to get one more question in, because it does it seems very interesting. In addition to being a teacher, I'm also a music therapist. I would like to ask Herbert about the contribution of music in oral production. He mentioned a rap. Could he talk a little bit more about his experience with teaching English coupled with music? Especially yeah, I can talk about my experience. I, I, I don't claim any, any expertise in the area of music. I mean, obviously, songs, the right songs, are extremely motivating. Songs have um, power in terms of helping students um, remember language, especially, of course, also um, when we think of, of uh, rhythm rhyme and tune so all these these auditory submodalities they contribute they are their memory anchors metaphorically speaking that that um, contribute uh, to the learning of uh, our, our students learning and then, then we must not underestimate also i mean our students are often stressed too you know it's not just teachers only being mm. stressed but students can, children even can have stress on them. So a song also helps to, to relax. And, and it's also about, about relaxing together, you know. Um, songs have some kind of a um, unifying power in, in a way. Sure. Well, I mean, and there's a number of other questions as well here. I mean, some of them, there is a theme. I think people are genuinely interested, you know, this idea of, a course book, an English course book, is is a lot more than just the language syllabus, and you, and you you have touched on that a lot, haven't you? Kind of the cultural values, um, and uh, you know, <laughs> social values, so much more than simply some a grammar syllabus, and uh, and and I think you you were very clear during your talk, you know, on how important that is when you're thinking about your courses. No, it's 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 the whole thing rather than you know, it obviously has one objective, you know, over, overarching objective, but it can do so much more, can't it? Yeah. And I mean, we, we must not forget one thing that um, the more we can actually uh, engage students by taking them seriously, by helping them to to develop their thinking skills and their understanding of the world, um, the more relevant we are making for them what we're doing linguistically with them. And at the same time, and this is the, the huge advantage of such an approach, we help them make more of their cognitive and social and psychological um, potentials. So, so I think it's a win-win uh, situation actually to go beyond uh, language. Of course, our first and foremost aim will always be 
to teach them uh, language well, of course, and, and will help them uh, to pass exams uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Herbert, for, for sharing your knowledge and experience. Um, as I say, the, the, the chat comments have been a, a sight to behold. Really, really great. Um, and that was, yeah, fascinating. <laughs>